welcome once again to the Empowering Patients podcast. This is your host, Theo Harvey, and I'm excited about what we're going to talk about today. Typically, we talk about remote patient monitoring, chronic care management, hospital at home, but today we have a special guest, uh, Mr. John Brown. Hi, John. How are you? What's up, brother? How you doing? Doing well, doing well. So John Brown has extensive background with civil and software engineering. John began his, his entrepreneur journey 25 years ago in technology and communications while he was training at Kennedy Space Center in the jet, in JPL. These experiences led to co-founding of Midnight Online in 1996 and a college-born technology startup that transitioned into, in 99 into the Midnight Group, an award-winning full-service integrated marketing and creative solutions firm. In addition to consulting, John is the founder and chief advocate of Black Men's Health, an initiative laser focused on creating more balance through health and men of color that he has been cultivating since 1999. A seed planted more than 20 years in the making, now actively working on bringing this vision fully to fruition and deploying this platform and associated resources on a global scale. John, that's great. So thank you for joining today. I think this is great for us to have you on the call as we kind of discuss the importance of crafting healthcare for specific communities, for in your case, for Black men. So I would we'll love to kind of get into it deeply. So, so thank you for your time today. Hey, good to be here. And I'm a, uh, since you got the mic set up and the producer on, maybe I need to have you do all my intros. That was a good Barry White, got, got your Barry White voice on. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not new to this. We do this a few times. <laughs> That's right. Hey, man, no, not well, new to this. <laughs> so thanks for doing this. So first, we usually get into the news. There's a recent study on med medical debt. And they said even with 90% of Americans uh, have health insurance, recently they found that medical debt at households were at 17% of all their you know, financial load. So basically almost 20% of Americans have medical debt. And this is something that's, you know, this was taken in 19, uh, 2019. So imagine after the pandemic, I'm right. assuming these numbers have, you know, increased. They said 23 million people, no, nearly one in 10 adults have significant medical debt, right? So the survey of income and, and program participation suggests that people in the United States owe at least 195 billion in medical debt, uh, which affects about 16 million people in the U.S. So this is huge, you know, kind of related to our conversation today. They found that middle-aged adults and Black Americans were more likely to have significant medical debt. So, for instance, um, you know, African Americans looks like um, the share of adults who have medical debt. Sixteen percent of those who had that medical debt were um, black. And then, you know, kind of also related to to you know our background in rural and south areas, they saw that the South led the pack with about twelve percent of all you know debt coming from that area. So, John, I mean, you know, this is um, <clears throat> something that you know we need to talk about because I think we talk about African Americans and healthcare. Medical debt, you know, the financials that are related to that. This is something that, you know, we're seeing more and more of. What are your thoughts in when it comes to this kind of, you know, what's happening right now in healthcare and how it's affecting, you know, African Americans? Yeah, I mean, medical debt is a serious thing, right? I, and, and sometimes not controllable, right? You, you, you don't you don't choose to have, you know, a an emergency event or or a medical event, right? Sometimes these things come up upon you. And depending on what kind of setup you are in at that stage of your life, that that will that could be a significant a significant burden, which is uh, a, a challenge. I, I remember, you know, I, I think I was working for a local government in all instances. No, that's not true. Not the baby boy. I have a 15 year old, a 12 year old and a seven year old, but at least the 15 year old and a 12 year old. I was working for local government at the time, a, a blessing to have that you know, those uh, health benefits when, when having a child, I remember looking at the hospital bill, right. You know, and, and, and seeing what my copay paid and what the rest of it is. And that, that's, that's a very expensive situation to have a child to be going in there. So having other situations that you didn't plan for could be, you know, severe. And, and, and Theo, we talk on, we're talking about medical debt potentially on top of other debt, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, exactly. you, you, you have some, you have some, uh, beautiful paper on the wall back there, respect, but, but, you know, a brother like yourself uh, or myself choosing to get, you know, education and even higher education 
at times that can be, you know, debt in itself. And everybody, I don't know about you, but I don't have a, a rich uncle that decided to write me a couple couple of ten thousand dollars plus you know maybe forty thousand dollars whatever it is to get some education so yeah and, and uh, of course we're not even talking about everyday living which um, a lot of people have debt in in general so yeah that's a challenge theo yeah i agree you know when you say personally yes i've incurred debt as well from i remember my wife was uh first pregnant for our child and you know everything was good had the baby forgot about it then it got that bill and uh, it was definitely something significant. Even I had health insurance at the time, but co-pays and paying the, 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 the doctors to come in, the aftercare, you know, it just started to add up. And so you're right. You know, we don't, I mean, my, my last name is Harvey and I have an uncle named Steve, but he's not that Steve. There you go. I don't have those resources either. And so, and, you know, like you said, we're, you know, some of the, the blessed few. And so, you know, you think about other folks who kind of go through that. And once you have your health loss, you, you're at a loss to kind of pay for that. And so, you know, I think the hope is, you know, medical innovations, solutions, you know, initiatives that you're kind of building. I think, you know, we can kind of help with that, you know, if people start looking at preventive ways, but also getting access to the care when they need it. I think they said yeah. during COVID, a vast majority of people didn't even go see the doctor because of, you know, yeah. the lockdown. So I, I'm sure those numbers have went up significantly, unfortunately, now in 2021. So, um, the, it's definitely something we got to be concerned about. Not, and not only access to healthcare, but I think just access to the information, right? I've been, as you know, I've been in an entrepreneurial journey since 1996. Again, I just talked about local government. I worked, I worked in local government from 2006 to, uh, two, so 2006 to 2008 and 2008 to 2015. Gaston County and Leon County. But other than that, other than a little stint doing some agency work, I pretty much have been on my own. Um, so having access to information is, is vital, right? I mean, people talk about, you know, the Affordable uh, Care Act and Obamacare and, you know, all of that good stuff. And that information is out there, but you got to understand how to navigate that. And uh, sometimes just walking in the door, if you are not aware or, or, or if it's just very intimidating, you can easily choose not to deal with it, which means that, again, if you, you know, have, you know, hypertension issues or diabetes or sickle cell or whatever it is, if you're not covered, you, you could potentially have coverage if you knew how to navigate the system and got access to the information. There could be benefits to help you, but you also have to be warm to going into environments where maybe you don't have the information and, and receiving the information. And insurance in itself can be a class system, right? I mean, Theo, you know, depending on who you work with, you could have that good insurance, what we call that Cadillac insurance, and you could potentially not have that good insurance, which means that, you know, in that same scenario, you could be paying a lot more for a copay or a lot more for other instances of something that you need that are a specialty. So yeah, yeah man, the, the, the medical. It's, it's almost like you need a degree to read your medical bill, right? I mean, you know, sometimes right. you don't even know what's going, where the copays are coming from and all that. And then, you know, I think there's some laws that were passed, right? You know, no surprise billing, you know, so hospitals are not supposed to surprise you with these uh, right. loan bills. So we'll see how well that gets, you know, implemented, right? It was one thing to make a law another thing to implement it. But I think hopefully those are, you know, starting to help people be aware of, you know, what the costs are so they don't get into this debt. And you're right. This is, you know, in addition to other debt, household debt, yeah. you know, our debt, uh, credit card debt. So it's just tons of things. So, you know, with that being said, you know, thank you for the discussion. I think this leads into a great, you know, transition, you know, when we talk about, you know, you know, black health, black men's health and the help that they need. One of the things that I'm really interested in is like, you know, crafting healthcare for specific communities who suffer from, you know, things like this medical debt and, and that knowledge and access. So tell us a little bit more about what led you down this path to create the Black Men's Health Initiative. Yeah. So my, you know, my background is engineering and uh, computer applications. And I had a blessed experience of being in the NASA family as you did, Theo, and did some work at Kennedy Space Center, amazing experience, did some work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and at JPL, had a lot of early internet technology experience, specifically on the back end. And in that work, I learned how to build functional systems and, and, and then learning how to, you know, tie them into the World Wide Web. And this is early, man, right? This is 90, you know, this is 94, 95, specifically 95. And was able to take this knowledge, come back to 
uh, campus, Florida and University, the best HBCU in the nation, and awesome. started a business in undergrad. And when you're in the space of doing website development in 1996, you're really in a digital real estate game as well, right? So not just your execution of services and consultation, but also in the sense of like, hey, you can buy up digital real estate and potentially own that forever. So we did. There's a lot of domains that we acquired, especially just knowing how to do it, right? I mean, and again, especially being an entrepreneur, the the, the path from zero to one is tremendous, right? I mean, you got to know how to get there and turn it into something, not just an idea. So understanding how to do that pretty quickly is beneficial. Uh, so we have we had and have a lot of, lot of digital real estate, and one of the acquisitions I made along the way was BlackMen'sHealth.com. That's mm-hmm. 1999. That's a long time ago, Theo. But but even looking at the path there, right, coming across an email. I mean, I remember the day, right? We're talking about like August, early August, 1999. Probably like August second or something of that nature. If I look back on it, 1999 sitting in my office with midnight, sending an email related to black women's health, um, immediately going to check out like the blackmenshealth.org, which was taken and then checking out blackmenshealth.com, which was available and immediately buying the real estate, like immediately. And one of the reasons that I bought it, my thought at the time, which is still very relevant today is just not enough representation, right? At the time, you know, we didn't have all of these d- devices and, you know, just at, at, at the level that it is now. So newsstands and physical print magazines were still huge. And Theo, in 1999, as well as today in 2022, if you go and look at the newsstand of men's magazines, period, but definitely related to health, that's just not enough us, right? It's a lot of white men. Period. And, and the women got it under control, man. And, and the women have done far better over the last, you know, decade or so. But if you're talking about tall, short, fat, skinny, you know, all beautiful colors of the rainbow, no matter what it is, if it's wedding dresses or photography or gardening or, you know, guns or cycling or whatever, the women got it under control, just diversity galore. But for men, especially big magazines, men's health, men's journal, men's fitness, it's like a lot of white boys, a lot of white boys, right? And if there is a man of color, specifically a black man, you and I know who they are 200, 300 yards away. It's like, oh, that's uh, Idris Elba. That's Jamie Foxx. That's, you know, Kevin Hart, Barack Obama, which is what I call kind of like the two to three percenters, right? Those are people that are like amazingly aspirational, but obtainable. Like, I mean, how many more Barack Obamas are they going to be? Right? I mean... Like Jamie Foxx, literally in a movie, his character's name is like Stax, right? Like Mr. Stax, right? I mean, it's like, and Idris Elba, they, you know, they're considering Idris Elba to be like one of the black James Bonds. I mean, like, that's like a small percentile of the population. So what about the 97 to 98% of us, right? The, just like regular brothers just trying to figure it out. That's what Black Man Self is about, man. Just creating this, this, this platform is really about creating more balance through health for men of color specifically black men. And we are covering that in, you know, holistically, right? Mental, physical, financial, spiritual, social. So this is not just about how to have rock hard abs and how to have sex all night long, right? This is about, you know, everything and balance, right, Theo? As you might know in academics, right? In academia, as well as in the medical professional, a lot of times we're asking men, specifically black men, to go from zero to like 11, like beyond 10, right? And that's not always feasible. So, you know, we are approaching men. We want to be relevant. We want to be approachable. And we want to, obviously, we, we want to give men information that's accessible and palatable to, to them. And you don't have to be on 10, right? I mean, maybe I can get you from zero to one. And if you can get from one, zero to one, maybe you can get to two. If I get you to two, maybe you can get to four. And maybe four is all you'll ever be. But four is a long way away from zero, right? And trying to get somebody from zero to 10 is like a lot, right? Trying to get somebody off the couch to like run a marathon is like, what? A marathon? We got to like, you know, take an approach to like move men. And as we say often, you know, kind of this mantra of this is not a arm around the shoulder. This is like a poke in the chest. This is like real life. Like, Theo, you, know, you got like a family to raise, like a community to, to, to build and a legacy to live. Like we don't have time to be playing with this. This is not like a nicety. This is like, you know, brothers are, 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 are dying and we have to we have to do more. That's what it's about, man. Easy as that. No, I mean, I can see your passion around this and, you know, and definitely going back, you know, to 1999 and just having that thought and just putting it out there into the universe. 
definitely, you know, key to like building something like this, especially if it's more of a movement, more of a, uh, you know, a passion project. And this is, you know, definitely along those lines. So, so I appreciate you doing that. And, you know, definitely you're right. It's, I talked to uh, Dr. Lee Green over at Mo Moffitt Cancer Center. He had talked about this as like, you know, research that goes into black men's health. It's almost nascent, right? And unfortunate. And to your point, but when you look at all the other health indicators, he said, the black men are always at the bottom of those lists. Like, you know, the, have, the you know, first, the first of the worst. Yes. That's what I say. The first of the worst, right? Yeah. It comes to like heart disease, diabetes, you know, he said, we're all, you know, you know, black men are always there, right? At the, the bottom of that list. And so it's something that, you know, I think is needed and necessary as we start to think about the future and, you know, strong families and just, you know, what's happening for this community. So, so now nah, thank you for, for thinking through that. I mean, so you know, if you kind of think of it like high level, you know, so you built it out, you started, you kind of talked a little bit about how you're approaching it from all the facets of a person's life. So what do you see next for this organization and how do you think you're building it out with partnerships and we'd love to kind of get your vision, grand vision of how this would uh, work out in the next 10 years, 20 years? Oh man, the vision is an octopus. That's a dangerous question. We don't have enough time for that today. Uh, but, but, but sharing with you again, obviously, you know, having something that I've been incubating, you know, since 1999 is uh, challenging in the sense of just, you know, what pieces to break off to, to execute. And I, and I will tell my team at times, listen, you know, when we're having discussions, talk to me about things that are tangible, th talk to me about things that are, that we can, you know, really, um, you know, create impact. Because again, there's a lot in here, right? A, a lot that's been baking. And it was time to get these things out of the lab and, and into the world because men need these and they don't have to be perfect. And I have to be careful there, Theo, especially as a communications marketing guy. Like I need things to have the I's dotted and the T's crossed and it'd be polished, right? You know, uh, if, if, if somebody's baking, the, even somebody helping me bake the cake, I need the icing to look like presentable when, when, it, when we're, you know, when we're passing the cake alone. So that, that can be a challenge for me, but eventually it was just time to do it. And, and I'll tell you, you know, even pre-pandemic, probably 1999, I was able, I, I even go back further, probably 2012, I put together an advisory team really to kind of set the mission for Black Men's Health. Like, look, it's time to like, put some things in motion. It never had enough oxygen and never had enough time and never had enough attention and never had enough resources if i had to do it over again as you know theo with my first business midnight online and the midnight group black men's health was a project i could have gave it to the the people that had the expertise in the room they could have built this out and we did a little thing to kind of just touch it and kind of preview it but nothing serious but it, it was time to give it some time and attention like i said 2012 got the advisory team together to kind of set some tone 2015 resigned from county government with one of the reasons why I wanted to give black men's health some more time and attention. I knew I couldn't do that immediately. Right. It's a startup. So got into some other work that could help, you know, feed the family, including, you know, consulting communications and marketing consulting. And uh, 2017 went into an incubator here in uh, Tallahassee, Florida, Domi, which is amazing and, and helped me really kind of pull some of those 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 thoughts out of my mind and get them down crystallized 2021 i actually went into a, a a cohort around fundraising called founder gym another amazing experience i knew it at a minimum it would have me you know connect with some other entrepreneurs that were moving in that direction and definitely help me lay down a foundation for you know raising funds if i needed to but 2019 I kind of really got frustrated, Theo, and just said, look, brothers need this. It doesn't matter how polished it is. I need to go. My wife and I have been doing experiences in some way, shape, shape or form. If it's, you know, summits, symposiums, conferences, whatever, probably since 1998. So we could do that with our eyes closed. And we're not scared of it. It's not intimidated. We're, you know, we could go big, bold. We could go small, you know, whatever it is. We could do events. So I kind of put a line in the sand and night in. 2019 and said black men's health is going to have some kind of experience in in 2020 like we, at, at a minimum we're gonna have a conference and i don't care what that looks like i don't care if it was 200 people or 2,000 people or 20 people but we're gonna do something and we're gonna do it in florida where i'm here we're gonna do it probably down in central florida or south florida tampa orlando make it easy for people to get to and just do it period put it on the date June 2020, you know, Men's Health Month, my dad's birthday, my birthday in June, like just put a date on the books and go ahead and do it. Had that mapped out, started pushing towards that. 
I was doing some local government support work. So obviously January, February, you're kind of seeing this come, right? Or yeah. COVID, right? And then, you know, by March, it was a wrap. Like the world is shut down. So yeah, we, we shifted. I won't even say had to pivot because we already had, you know, components built in that related to, you know, back in the day, what we call webinars, right? This is a webinar back in the day, right? But this this form of communication obviously became, you know, like, the norm in in COVID and and it allowed us to get to some information um, and get access to some people immediately. So we took our you know idea of that conference that was going to happen in June 2020, shifted into a virtual conference. And as we were preparing for that and kind of stacking the deck and getting all of the pieces together, one of my team members said, "This is ridiculous. Why are we doing this? Why are we trying to do this on one day, two days? Why not just space it out and give people the opportunity to?" Touch it in different ways, which I thought was brilliant because Theo, no matter what your interest level is, if your son or daughter have something going on and it's in conflict with the date that I have something going on for a panel that you want to be involved yeah. with, you're not going to be there, right? You just, right. But, but if we spread it out, it will give you an opportunity to touch it more. So that's what we did. We spread it out. We had a, a summer lunch series, a, a part of this kind of discussions that need to be had and amazing discussions, man, just brothers talking to brothers about relevant subjects. As you know, you can almost finish each other's sentences in some certain scenarios because we're dealing with the same thing. And it doesn't matter if it's, you know, somebody Theo Harvey 20 years ago or Theo Harvey 20 years from now, some of these some of these lived experiences are the same. So we've done that. And now obviously we have the website going like a really like raging in the sense of information. We have a, a, a an interim editor in chief, Takuma uh, Roback. He's a FAMU grad also amazing journalist has a skill and a passion related to, you know, black men's health. And we're just building, man, you know, have some communications specialists or communications consultant. And my job is really to kind of continue to try to find resources and access to information just to build on that. I know it will come. I believe that activity will drive that, that activity will drive impact and impact will drive revenue. And the more impact I can make, the better. The more revenue I can get, the more impact I can, you know, I can fold back into impact. And, and it's for real, right? I mean, it's like, you know, I, I told somebody I was in a meeting with the university recently and I told him, Theo, I mean, you heard those pillars, you know, those areas we focus on for holistic health, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Mental, physical, spiritual, financial, social, all of that's amazing work. All of that's great work. We all need balance in those areas, especially brothers that are really, you know, at the top of their game, right? You and I mean doing your thing. Sometimes you start to strategize and push towards greatness and excellence and more. Sometimes you are not doing the things to keep you balanced, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just for real with anybody, but especially in the black community, it's not like we had dads that, you know, woke up, you know, and, and swimming four times a week or running five times a week. A lot of people just don't have that experience. So that stuff is not, you know, inherently baked in. We got to, you know, do the work to bake that in. So, you know, we just, we just continue to build, man. And I know, like I said, that meeting at FSU, no matter what we're doing in all of those spaces, all of that's important. All of that is important for balance, but at a minimum, you know, if the work that we do, especially related to mental health, you know, creates a scenario where we can give just one man hope to get to tomorrow, I've done enough, right? I've done enough. I mean, we got a lot of scenarios that a lot of uh, brothers are choosing to not be here. And mm -hmm. we have to figure out how do we create spaces and places and faces that again, relevant and relevant and powerful connections that somebody says, Hey, I'm struggling. I'm struggling for real, for real, but, but I can deal with this tomorrow. Right. And, and maybe through a brother like Theo, somebody that they could just see this doing it right. Or, or, or they believe that Theo's is accessible enough where they can have a discussion that that's vital. So, so we're just doing the work, man. Just doing the work. I mean, wow. Lots to unpack there, but I mean, you know, it's, the passion around this again, you know, I love what you said about the activities. You know, I agree. You know, activities drive impact, drive you know revenue, 
And so, you know, that's kind of what we believe in startup world as well, you know, having, you know, more activity so you can learn faster and do more and then you'll understand more. So I think that's powerful. And then, you know, what you're saying is just that impact mental health, you know, was a stigma in our community for so long. And so now that people are speaking up, talking about it and, you know, they have apps now, right, Calm and other things where you see LeBron James, you know, communicating the importance of, you know, mental health and peace. So so everything you're saying, you know, I think, we you know, we want to see more of that. And look, you know, I think, you know, any small way we can connect you with the folks that we know what we're doing with our, our space uh, uh, in a patient monitoring, you know, helping patients who suffer from chronic conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes. You know, a lot of them are black men. Matter of fact, we did an IRB with a hospital where we were helping black men suffer from COPD. They were just coming to the hospital so much because, you know, they didn't understand what are some of the cause factors for causal factors for them to to go back in simple things is taking an inhaler you know and so we caught, saw that for you know a small subset of black men in middle georgia and so you know to your point seeing that impact that we're having even on a small level and then scat you know you know increasing that across the populations i think is key but especially you know the hardest hit if you can change them then you can you know open the door for a lot of other folks so so no, this is uh, very impactful, John. So look, this is our time. Thank you for your time today, just talking about your passion and helping the Black community and, and giving people wisdom and thoughts on how they can shape it for their community as well when it comes to healthcare. So everyone, please like and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever else you listen to podcasts. Thank you all for being on this journey with us that we continue to build better patient health. Take care. Thank you, brother.